thank you. I actually came here because I was uh, told to come here, so that there is no feedback to the microphone. <laughs> but happy to be here, it's a privilege, it's uh, many years of work which I will uh, discuss uh, with you. Uh, of course, uh, you know me, my day job is very different than the, in the script. Um, and in the evenings and on weekends, I'm spending time with uh, family and uh, friends and neighbors. So when does this work get done? It's a mystery, but uh, um, we'll talk about it. And also, all of you will definitely have opinions. Uh, the Indus Valley is something dear to all of us, one way or the other. So either we believe that uh, it's the ancestral home for all Indians, or some of us might take a stance that it's the ancestral home for Dravidians, or some of us uh, will say that, no, it is a Sanskrit-based uh, uh, language. As of now, uh, there is um, many attempts at decipherment, but I can safely say that there is no decipherment. So today, today I will be talking about another attempt, and I'll show that it's quite comprehensive. Um, I'll tell you what are the gaps and what needs to be done as well. Uh, I'll share uh, stories not only from India, but uh, from neighboring regions as well. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm sharing those uh, stories, um, because we can, couldn't have evolved in isolation. And you will form your opinions. Uh, uh, I was expecting a heated uh, discussion as well. So some of them who would do that are not yet here, but I'm sure they'll <laughs> they will, uh, make their uh, way. They promised me that they're going to uh, you know, create uh, noise. Uh, so look forward to all interactions. And uh, we will, uh, through the session, you can stop me anytime. But I would uh, suggest that if we can wait for about 20, 25 minutes, I'll go through the material. And some of your questions might be answered along the way. And that way, when you do uh, have the interactive session, we have sufficient time. I would actually like you to state your position, your opinions, because it's not just about uh, questions. There is no expert here. Everybody is trying to get to uh, knowing uh, our ancestors. Right? So with that, I'll get started. Uh, this is an interesting seal. This is the uh, uh, seal called Object 1400, so 1400. Right? So this seal, which you see here with the various numbers, uh, is the seal which has been used by a couple of authors to say that probably, probably the Indus Valley script, the so-called Indus Valley script, is not encoding languages. And uh, that uh, paper created quite a storm. And this was uh, Steve Farmer and his uh, colleagues who did it. And full respect to him. Uh, he did a lot of work. He tried to decipher the uh, script. Uh, couldn't do it. So then he reached the next uh, best conclusion that it's not a script. right? <laughs> and then he put out uh, even a competition saying, if anybody could decipher this long script, at that time and even now, it is the longest seal in terms of writing, the Indus writing on a seal. So he said, if anybody can decipher it, I'll pay them $10,000. Of course, it takes much more effort than $10,000 to decipher anything like this. And I can say that I have done it. Um, but the proof of it is not something that is easy to give. But I'll let you uh, all uh, go through my work and tell me what you think about it as well. So why is it? Um, that uh, it was said that this particular seal shows that the Indus Valley script is not a script. Any guesses? It looks more like design. Yeah, so it uh, looks more like design, but uh, the uh, various uh, letters in an alphabet could also be like uh, design. So if you don't mind, if you have an input, uh, just raise your hand and they'll give you a mic also because it's being uh, recorded, but I'll repeat anyway, so it's okay. Anybody else? Take a guess. Many symmetrical, Many symmetrical figures, okay, but okay. Yeah, it could be the case. Um, there are many languages where the figures are symmetric, uh, like A, for example, is a symmetric, but I get your point. Um, more uh, graphical in uh, nature. See, the, if you are looking at deciphering a script, there's one more answer there, yes. Yeah, so that was the answer, actually. Fantastic. Applause to everyone, actually. For it. So you, uh, let me repeat uh, what that answer was and explain. 
if you are trying to decode a coded message, let's say that Manu wanted to send a love note uh, to someone and they have a secret code and you assign certain uh, code numbers or code characters for each of the letters. The first step you would do in trying to de decipher that code is figure out if it is English language, if you assume it's English language, figure out the largest number of repeated letters and then use that as uh, a starting point and say that is E. If it is long enough, if there is a paragraph and you count the letters, you will find that the largest number of repeated letters is E. Then you start your process of uh, decipherment. So Steve Farmer's uh, statement was, look at this. It is a long, and it is the longest Indus script ever discovered on a seal. There is not even one repeated letter, right? So this cannot be a language. Uh, and these are all high frequency signs. If high frequency signs are not repeated, definitely it is not a language. And his view and his co-author's view was that hence, this is like uh, religious symbols, like we put an om or a swastika and a fish and so on and so forth over a door. Like the symbols at the bottom is an actual seal. So something like that goes over a door, um, just representing religious uh, symbols, uh, not uh, saying anything. So swastika is not used in representing language. Om is not used in representing language in a manner of uh, speaking. Right? But it is actually a letter. Uh, swastika is uh, not. So that was his uh, conclusion. Uh, at the same time, there were many um, writers, um, and uh, this is some of the work which I'll refer to, who looked at it statistically and came from well-reputed institutions. Um, there were many of them not uh, linguists, uh, and uh, showed statistically that the nature of the signs are such that it has to represent a notation. It could be a language, it could be music notation, but it is conveying a message of some kind. Right? So there is sufficient work after this paper that again brings back Indus as a uh, potential uh, encoding of language. And there is one more aspect, which is uh, trade seals. So these two papers uh, also talk about uh, trade seals. These three papers talk about trade seals. The authors, there are two, uh, Rao and uh, Mukhopadhyay, Bahata. Uh, and they have done really good work in talking about, for the first time, comprehensively, structurally, identifying that uh, these are trade seals, which means that they were issued for a license, maybe, or for interacting between a purchaser uh, and uh, the uh, seller, or a, a royal decree allowing a certain activity to take place, or a temple which is getting a donation. Whatever it might be, the um, they were identified as um, trade seals. Now these seals, um, if you have gone to, let's say, the museum in Delhi, uh, the National Museum in Delhi, uh, or you have visited any one of the sites where uh, you will find, we went to Rakigari, and there is a gentleman there who will take you around. And at his home, he has seals. Uh, he has given many away, but he has kept some of them. And you will see that these are very small, one inch by one inch at the most typically smaller uh, than that. So these are proper tokens of uh, some kind, mostly. But you'll also find that in Mohanjada, in, sorry, in uh, Dolavira, uh, there is a huge archway, and uh, under that collapsed is a set of signs, very large. So that is at the gateway of uh, Dolavira. I've been there, seen that, uh, and uh, appreciated that uh, this probably is not a trade seal. It was too large. Uh, probably uh, you know six feet in length um, and uh, one feet uh, in other, the other dimension because it's just fallen down is the uh, uh, scholarly understanding of uh, what happened to that uh, sign. So none of these have been truly deciphered. Any decipherment attempt um, has been one of two things. It is uh, either um, somebody who has a deep passion for some aspect of India, so that passion could be Sanskrit, that passion could be um, uh, Dravidian, whatever it might be, there is a, a hypothesis made based on passion and own connection, uh, and uh, then you proceed to try to prove that. 
But those attempts have been quite frail, uh, is the best way uh, to put it. Even from the best known colleges, the work which has come out uh, has not been complete. Uh, the other attempt has been made also by scholars from the West. Um, some of them have done decent work. Some of them do not know the context of India, so they'll say uh, Dravidian, and then they will use goddess names or gods names which are not Dravidian from those uh, times. Uh, so, uh, the, the, and hence, until most recently, there has not been a very comprehensive uh, set of work which has deciphered. But there has been good work. Mahadevan is one somebody mentioned. Mahadevan has done a great service by collecting all the signs uh, which have been found and um, you know organizing them, organizing the seals. Uh, so it becomes very easy. Uh, one of the things which happened as I went through my decipherment is um, I met a lady by name Bhata, whose uh, reference is here, and uh, she gave me the database which she had along with the software that uh, she wrote, which made it readily accessible. So you could uh, look up a sign, you could then type in the sign into the fields and get all the seals which had that sign. So the frequencies, etc., etc., you could get it easily, and that helps. Um, so there is a lot to be discussed, uh, but I'll summarize on this slide that no decipherment has been complete. No decipherment has been accepted uh, by all scholars. So there is a lot of work to be done. My work is extension of the work done by these folks in that they believe that a majority of the seals are trade seals. I agree with that and you'll see that uh, what I have done is taken it further and said each sign what they could mean. And uh, that work has not been done before such comprehensive way and in such a systematic way, uh, as you will see. So before going further, I uh, wanted to point out that the Indus Valley was not in isolation, was never in isolation. It was known that they traded uh, in the near uh, region. Uh, so it's very difficult to believe that the script would uh, be so different from any of the neighboring uh, regions. Not the script in terms of its um, individual signs, but in terms of its uh, structure and usage and purpose. Right? It would highly likely be that they had a uh, common basis for what the script was being used. Uh, for, uh, if it is for trade, then it was being used for trade across the board. If it was for trade and language purposes, then you would use it for trade and language purposes, mainly across these regions at least. So you have uh, Sumeria, uh, and um, you know the, there is good amount of work. If you go to the British Museum, you'll see enormous collections of Sumerian uh, script. Uh, there is a gentleman by name Ashur Banipal, and when he conquered, he was a king in Sumeria. When he went and conquered, uh, he didn't take anything much other than the knowledge of that region. And he created libra a library, which is the reason why we have that wealth of Sumerian um, script, uh, which today is in the British Museum. I say it's OK that it's in the British Museum, because they are doing all the AC and uh, maintenance, and uh, everybody can uh, go and uh, see it. There's a lot of Indian artifact also in the uh, British Museum. And then there is a lesser known uh, set of uh, uh, people and their language called Elam. I don't know whether I'm saying it correctly. It's spelled E-L-A-M. Um, Sumeria, more or less, everybody will say it that way. Uh, but Elam, uh, the script there even predates uh, the Sumerian script. The Sumerian script is what evolved to the cuneiform script, uh, which you uh, all would have heard about, uh, which uh, uses uh, stylus and creates the uh, language. But it evolved from something more primitive and that something more primitive is very similar to the Indus script, which is what I wanted to uh, show here. So this is the archaic cuneiform script. The final cuneiform script is similar to this, um, in that uh, whatever they could do using stylus and by poking into the clay uh, to get this kind of uh, design is how the uh, cuneiform script uh, evolved. And all modern day writing is said to go back to that origin. Right? So this is uh, what it looks like uh, even before it became more uh, evolved. But you can see it was very functional. Right? Uh, there would be signs about bread. There would be signs about uh, uh, a bow. Uh, there would be signs about a dagger. Um, 
And uh, there would be, uh, you know, simple things like if you want to show a back of a person, uh, you draw the torso and the legs and then shade the back. Right? You can see that here. Right? So you see that there is a shading and that is called a back. Uh, and then the nourish is showing the bread. This is a symbol for a bread. And showing the mouth. Shaded means that is the region they want you to focus. If you look for the sign for the mouth, you'll see that same thing. It's the mouth without the bread. Right? So if you, like me, uh, stare at this for long enough, you'll go either mad or you'll be able to give a half talk like I'm doing right now. Um, but you will start recognizing uh, these signs and what they uh, mean. So there are some, like the fish, which is there in the Indus uh, Valley script as well. Um, and Indus Valley script ha has many uh, representations of the fish. Uh, so it's a question to ask why. Uh, and there are uh, you know, things that you want to understand, the sheep fold. Uh, but th what you will see here is that there is hardly any religious basis or astrological uh, basis. Many of the people who worked on the Indus script tried to decode the script using either astrology, uh, saying Arumin. Arumin means some constellation, uh, six, and there is a fish. Min is also a star. Fish is also mean. So the way Purpula went about saying is that there is a number six and there is a fish. So that's Arumin, and hence it is the constellation which goes by that, that name. So those have been the attempts. And like I said, since there has been no decipherment, no point in saying they're wrong, you're, you're right, and so on and so forth. But this ability to look at our neighbors, very few people have attempted. It has been attempted. So it is, I'm not the first. I'll tell you where I'm uh, going to be the first, is taking a look at object 1400 and uh, what I'm going to interpret it as. That will be the first, and then how I extend it to the rest of the science. That will be a uh, first. Rest of it, what I'm sharing, no credit to me, other than the fact that I have looked at many papers, a lot of great work which has happened. So now, okay, there are signs. There are uh, these signs. Uh, these signs were used by Sumerians. They were also used by Akkadians who lived in the north of the same region. So Sumeria was south of Iraq. Uh, Akkad was in the north of uh, Iraq. So the, the same signs can be used for different languages. Okay, so there is a sign here for uh, king. You, do you see it here? There is a sign for king. There is a sign for man. And uh, hold on to that image because I'll show it again. The difference between uh, the sign for the king and the man is uh, something which looks like a crown um, on the top or he's holding, holding a harrow of some kind. Right? So it's one of those. Um, however, uh, that symbol stands for great. So in isolation, that symbol stands for great or, or big. So it could be big man. Uh, in Sumeria, it is called Lugal. Um, so it translates to big man or king. Right? And uh, let me go here. And you'll see that uh, in these are signs from that region, uh, Akkadian, Sumerian. Um, I'll tell you a little more. But if you look at the sign on the left, the uh, sign on the left is uh, an account of what has been paid to labor on various days of a week. Right? Looks like they had a five-day week then also because <laughs> it, records only, it records only five uh, days. Um, so let me pause here just to get you interactive. Um, can you tell me uh, where do you see uh, days being recorded? Anybody? Okay, that's one day, but something which tells you which day of the week it is? The number of legs. Where do you see legs? Yeah, correct. So you're right. You call those legs. So fantastic. So this is one, two, three, four is sort of lost somewhere. This is five, right? And that sign, I'll go back uh, first. Um, sorry. Going wrong direction. Yeah, here. If you see here, there's somewhere, yeah, you see that sun day light right around there. So that is basically showing, uh, this, is, this has been written for ease of printing, but otherwise it's a semicircle with a half, looks like a BJP symbol, is it? <laughs> Something like that, rising uh, sun. But uh, yeah, 
so so that you can see come up here and you can see how it is getting used it is each day being recorded somewhere in between is the name of the person being paid and how that person is being paid right so this symbol here is bread yeah so i know that um, that symbol there is bread so you can say that uh, yeah this uh, uh, is a tool for accounts but is that all so hence i put up the uh, image on your right and you can see here that uh, there is a king and this king is been translated as saru i don't know how to say it but saru it is not lugal because this is akkadian so the same uh, set of uh, uh, signs have been used in the south as well as in the north but as you can imagine uh, if you have something as important as a script uh, at least some of that is going to be talking about the kings of the region right um, and uh, in the case of uh, the indus valley uh, which is not so far from all these regions why do you think that only accounts were uh, being treated with this uh, these signs um, so uh, there have been arguments why you didn't find other seals which uh, which had longer script and um, the arguments include that they were written on perishable material maybe this region had far more advanced technology so they wrote on palm uh, leaves much earlier um, or some other form of uh, perishable material hence the longer uh, scripts did not uh, survive but then uh, of course uh, steve farmer and others do not agree with that and uh, they say that uh, why only in india that uh, there will be such a situation that longer scripts uh, will not survive when uh, scripts have survived everywhere else so these are all open questions and and hence the debates will uh, never end um, but i go with the assumption that uh, if uh, you have a form of writing and that form of writing is used for accounts and that form of writing depicts bread in a certain way and there is a word for bread uh, then if you're talking about uh, bread in some other context you might be using it as a language so right or wrong that is the way i will be uh, proceeding and uh, you will uh, see that happening let yeah, yeah mic mic play one second hold for the mic they're trying to record the doesn't matter comment or a question you please feel free just uh, make sure you have the mic uh, any idea what will be the size of these uh, tablets or what you have displayed on the slide so the uh, <coughs> the uh, work which you see in the british museum is huge taller than these walls oh. but those are royal uh, uh, writings capturing knowledge of Uh, different countries from ashur banipal's library mm -hmm. these are recording uh, daily labor so uh, uh, expect them to be very small uh, so they are going to be baked in their first in, uh, impressions made in clay and then baked it i have not seen the, these signs uh, myself but i can guess that it will be 6 uh, inches by 6 inches kind of a dimension yeah, because still, of the nature of what yeah the, yeah so basically still quite bigger than that of the indus seals if yes. we count indus seals as 1 inch by 1 inch these yeah. are yeah. way Absolutely. larger and the one yes. which is about the king yeah you can assume that it will be very large okay <laughs> right the kings want everything big yeah, yeah. thanks yeah. I, i can pause there if there are any other comments or questions okay and so akkadian the king is sleeping <laughs> So it's, let, it's horizontal. Yeah. So all of these uh, scripts, including uh, the Indian scripts, at one time they were in a different direction. So the standing king slept when it was easier to write on the uh, using the instruments they were using on the material they were using and accommodating as much as possible. So if they are writing it like this, they went ahead and made the king sleep because they wanted the text to come in between a certain set of parallel lines. So that's how it worked. Uh, so before a certain time all the scripts you'll see is the king standing that's why you saw that in archaic sumerian which i showed uh, that you please remember this as a sign of a king he was standing right all right so then this is the total list of the indus valley script found to date more or less 420 characters now the question will come is if this is going to be just religious depiction on top of a doorway do you need 420 of those right uh, 
uh, it is very difficult to expect that you need 420 decorative uh, signs. But some of the comments about symmetry and all of that also uh, come into play because maybe they were not uh, 420 uh, signs which were always used. Uh, but uh, randomly, depending on the designer's choice, uh, they could use block printing technique and hence they were decorative uh, elements or used for political purposes to declare just like you have uh, one stripe, two stripes and three stripes uh, or stars denoting a four star general for example or yeah. There is a question, Mike please. Where? Sorry Advaita, making you run but uh, it's better. Uh, so, uh, as per my uh, study, uh, Indus Valley civilization did not have any political structure. Uh, so, they were, there was not a structure of uh, hierarchical governance, the way that you are interpreting it at the moment. So, the, uh, where did I interpret the hierarchy? Uh, in terms of making it de decorative for political purposes. Sorry? Uh, making the script decorative for political purposes. Ah. Yeah, it's a fair uh, statement. Uh, and very well uh, read is that uh, it is highly likely that the Indus Valley script um, was governed by a merchant guild, multiple merchant guilds. You will be very happy Shilpa. Uh, so uh, these merchant guilds governed uh, the uh, uh, Indus Valley is how it is uh, thought for sure. Uh, there is the Great Bath for example in Mohenjo-daro and uh, similarly there is a citadel in uh, Dolavira. Uh, there are uh, big uh, structures. So while the hierarchy was less um, and also the warring was less because weapons were not uh, found, uh, there, there might not have been a hierarchy but there would be a structure to govern. Yeah, microphone again no, please. No, but this is a good point. I'm happy you brought it up because it's useful. Yeah, because uh, useful for uh, interpreting the script for decorative purposes for political interpretations. Because uh, it was not governance by a central authority or body. It was a model in which uh, the education system was based on self-governance of conduct at a personal level. Yeah. Hence, the uh, need was not for a external agency to uh, define... Uh, the model code of conduct. So that is definitely a good hypothesis, is something which I also think is right. But we cannot make it a definitive statement. There is no record of something like that. Nor ever in the entire world has the, there been a region which has been governed in this manner by just merchant guilds uh, because there, there will be fighting. There will be somebody who has to bring in the order into that. But my point is different. My point is I don't even agree with that. My point is that I am not saying that. There are other writers who have said, Steve Farmer, etc., that it has been used either for religious or political and not encoding a linguistic uh, tool. It's not a linguistic tool. So I am with you uh, in terms of saying that it, if so many signs are there, uh, it has a better purpose than just being decorative. And if it is just decorative, um, then um, you will not find the characters come in the same sequence and on such small seals, what decoration are you talking about? You know, one inch by one inch and less, what would you decorate? Maybe block print uh, fabric, but you know, it's just highly unlikely. If they call my work speculative, which uh, when you go through uh, journal publication, you will get such messages that uh, it is speculative. It is as speculative as somebody else's work. So you will see how I am going to go about doing it. But I am with you. I hope I get that message, right? Yeah. Uh, Gopi, yes. I have a question. Um, so if one keeps looking at that, it looks like, and I mean, this may be a very yeah. dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, for example, suppose you say ka, and then you're building on it to say ka, ki, yeah. ki. So if you look at that, it looks like there is a basic yeah. something, and then it's being Absolutely. added to. Absolutely. So is that... Uh... Yeah, so many of us initially looked at it like that. Um, but also there is another way to think about it. There is a basic structure. For example, let's uh, look at this structure. 
here. Sorry, I'm moving away from the camera. Just I'll point out to the numbers there. So you can look at 287 and then look at 288, 289, 290, 291, 292, up till there. Now it could be what you're saying or it could be a number. It could be 10, 11, 12, 13. They're adding strokes to say that on 10 I'm putting one stroke. So that would be another way to uh, think about it. Right? Sorry? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. It won't show on the screen. Ah, uh, there, it shows. Okay. Thank you. So, the, uh, yeah, you're right. So, we have wandered and meandered down these paths enough and hit roadblocks enough um, uh, that, yeah. But what you're saying is still valid. However, it doesn't correspond to how the characters were used in the neighboring regions. So just keeping in mind that this was 3000 BC, approximately 2500 BC, uh, all the way until 1500 uh, BC, um, and there were neighbors using characters in a particular way. Uh, I'm trying to uh, constrain my meandering after having walked all over the place to trying to see if I can bring some of that logic in. And there's one more logic which I'll talk about. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, so th this is the set of characters. Any other observations from seeing these uh, characters? So we'll come back to these. Uh, uh, if you have a favorite character, keep it in mind. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll see how we can, yes. Just one more thing. Yeah. So why is the numbering given like this? Just as they were found? Or is there some logic to the numbers? So the wonderful gentleman Mahadevan uh, did the compilation. And it's not as they were found because they were arranged in a certain order. That's why you could see that 287, 288, 289 all come together. And uh, these signs are found uh, uh, in a tablet which has many other signs. So you cannot get an order to that because the other signs on that tablet or that seal would be all over this map. Yeah. Okay. So uh, moving on and we can come back to this um, many times. But this is the core of my uh, presentation is that, okay, you said that if the signs are not repeated in a long enough uh, writing, then it is not a language. But if you are like me, an Indian, and believe that it is a language or whatever, and but then try to scientifically figure out where would it be that signs are there, there is a long writing and it is not repeated. It will either be an alphabet, if you have an alphabet written down to teach people how to write, it will be A to Z, nobody will repeat E several times, or it could be a glossary. Right? Uh, so I started my work thinking that uh, it could be the most frequently used <coughs> letters in the Indus alphabet. That would be quite revolutionary, which means that alphabetic writing goes back to Indus Valley. I still wish that it is the correct way to think about it. It could be the case also. But what I'm going to present to you, given that I have accepted the trade hypothesis, that many of the seals which remain are trade seals, even though it could have been used for language in other places, um, and we do not have too many of those examples. Um, so I'm going to say that this is a trade glossary and proceed from there. And then on top of that, I'm going to say that if it is a trade glossary, then how should I think about it, right? And what is the unique insights it will give me? Uh, so the um, first line, if I see that there are so many signs which correspond to fish, then I classify the whole line, since it is straight, and make it correspond to fishing. And the second line, since there are so many corresponding to agriculture, let me make the whole line agriculture based uh, trade glossary. And the last line is hunting, so let me make the last line completely a uh, hunting uh, uh, glossary, which means characters which represent a tax or a commodity pertaining to each one of these professions, right? Uh, and this is going to be uh, very unique in that uh, this sign, this particular seal rather, has not been interpreted like this um, and it's going to create everybody to uh, get angry with me saying that, uh, oh, how come you can speculate like this out of uh, thin air? I have no problem. The good thing about not being a linguistic is you can beat me up. Right, uh, uh, and, and I will only learn and uh, grow uh, from there. But just think about it. The first uh, wheel-like sign, which you see there, has been interpreted as wheel by Mahadeva. Uh, however, 
If I were to put it in the fishing line, there are no wheels in the fish, uh, fishing profession, nor where there are spoked wheels in Indus Valley. So if there are no spoked wheels in Indus Valley, how can this represent a wheel? It doesn't. And also it is not circular. You look at uh, the signs which are there, actual signs, they are not circular, they are oval. Right? And hence, I say that this is a fishing net. The fishing net used uh, to uh, scoop out fish, gudem uh, uh, as they call it in uh, proto Dravidian or uh, uh, in Tamil, ga becomes ka, so kutem. Uh, and uh, also, uh, there is a term for uh, village in uh, fishing village, fishing hamlet in uh, South Indian language, which has the same uh, root word. Right? So, we'll talk about that as we go along. So each one of those lines, each one of those characters, hence becomes something to do with fish. The last one looks like an arrow, correct? But since it is in a fishing line, I will say that it's not an arrow, it's a stingray fish. And uh, the test for that would be, you can't have a stingray fish if you don't have a word for that in proto -Dravidian. My hypothesis is also pro Dravidian, right? So if you don't have such a word for a stingray fish, in uh, your language, the uh, Dravidian language which you are trying to say is the hypothesis, then it fails. But there is a word and it is used uh, quite uh, frequently. And similarly, the second line, the first character, okay, why I am going from right to left is because Indus Valley script is read right to left by almost all uh, scholarly uh, work. And how you determine that is your right hand side is all aligned, your left hand side is not aligned. Right, so hence they have been writing right to left is the assumption. So uh, the first sign on uh, the second line from going from right to left, anybody, what it could be? I already said agriculture. Land. Band. Land. 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 The, you, you could be right, the, the notations around uh, could be land, but somebody said plow and that is a plow for sure uh, because it has been similar signs have been used in Sumerian as well. Now, uh, what you are saying is very interesting because there is only one in the entire 4000 odd seals found, there is only one which looks like this. Rest of them have only the plough. Only this one has the plough within the quotes, if you would. Right? Uh, so, but anyway, if we say that is the agricultural line and the plough is a known uh, thing, then we go to the next one, it's a seedling. Um, otherwise, mortar and pestle has been some of the interpretation. But since I'm saying it is agriculture, for me, it becomes a seedling. In proto dravidian Molaka. Molaka means it's a seedling, right? And so then I can, so there could be, if you're going into agriculture and you're issuing a license to farm, um, then you issue license for various aspects of the activity. We do not know that time and age. We cannot say things definitely, but that becomes a seedling. Next one becomes, um, the uh, uh, palam when it is when it is grown, and then it becomes the harvested grain of uh, you know the produce the grain. Uh, we'll talk about uh, more detail. The last line similarly uh, is hunting. So the first set could be spears, uh, uh, it could be uh, arrows. Uh, the second a shield. If I didn't put it in the hunting line, there is no way I can tell what it is. You will be all over the place. So by putting it in this context, at least have a faint hope of narrowing down what it could mean. Now the 180 sign, it could, I mean, what would you call it? It looks like a spider. It looks like anything that uh, you can think about. But since I put it on the hunting line, I will call it a hunting whip, which is used, right? Speculative, yes. Less speculative than others, I think yes also. Uh, then you have the trishul, uh, right, uh, the trident. And 267 is interesting, right? Because uh, um, uh, my colleagues uh, who have done this work in the past have looked at it as a seed, the red seed with the black head, uh, which are used for weighing gold, right? Uh, so because it does look like it. Uh, in the, when it is actually put, uh, when you actually see the sign in the seal, it is not angular like this, it's curved. And it's got something on the uh, top. Um, but since it is in this line, I'm calling it the noose, right? So, and the noose is a symbol in used in Sumerian as well. And um, it is used uh, in, uh, in the hands of, a religi hands of a religious deity called Inanna. And in our uh, religious uh, deities also, you will see the Pasham, the noose. Uh, so, hence I am saying that it is a noose. A noose 
is Uri in uh, Proto Dravidian in Telugu as well. And Uru is also similar sounding. And uh, hence, I am saying that this is going to be used for a tax paying hamlet. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, that. And the last one is a dead animal. So it belongs very well in a hunting line. <laughs> that is the, at the end of the day, yeah. On uh, symbol 267, yeah. uh, since you, you've also compared with uh, other nearby civilizations, a uh, similar hieroglyphic in ancient Egyptian refers to a walled town. Yes, and citadel. Uh, in a citadel. Yeah, so I was just so coming to that. Yeah. Uh, Kunt 267, as opposed to being a tax paying hamlet, could it not refer to <coughs> a city or a city with a citadel, especially given Uru, yeah, uh, which yeah. is also the uh, perhaps the origin of a lot of the terms. So, I mean, I, I, I know That's this is little speculated. I'm just proposing that what also has been pointed out by oh, uh, others. So, in fact, Uru is a tax paying town, as in this tax is being paid by this town to this. Uh, entity, right? So that's exactly the point as well. Yeah, thank you for so all well read uh, and research people. Thank you very much. Um, so I know that uh, this is interesting, but I'll have to go through now a series of signs and uh, uh, give you the uh, thoughts behind it. So the first uh, one I already showed that it's so what I've done is I've said what are the most frequently used uh, signs. And uh, so if you're trying to decipher, and again, this is something which uh, has not <coughs> happened in the past. Uh, taking, being bold to say that, let me take all the frequently used signs, and let's see if I can interpret them in this manner for trade uh, seals, right? And, uh, 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 and in doing that, in other people's work, no, no disrespect, great work, is that they've uh, looked at uh, some of the signs which uh, they could interpret and then interpret it. But that is, uh, I think, uh, one way to do it. This way to do it is more difficult. It took me a long time and a lot of help from uh, several people sitting in this room to count the frequency. Seema, my wife, is sitting there. Divya is sitting there. To do this proper uh, PPT, I got help from Nimisha. There is a neighbor who many of you know, Sridhar, who gave me his measuring vessel called Marakal. So I think uh, uh, there is enough help I got along the way. It's, it takes a long time. Every sign you go put it in, count how many uh, seals have that sign and so on and so forth. Got a lot of uh, help. So now let's look at the first one. Hun out of 4,000 plus seals, 1,378 of those seals have that sign. And it's always more or less in the same position. It is terminal left. So since you're reading right to left, it's terminal left. Uh, so it is. it has got some meaning. Um, and... Uh, Here's how I interpreted it, is that uh, in Proto-Dravidian, the word for rice uh, is Ari. In Proto-Dravidian, the word for tax is also Ari. So probably the um, word uh, and the tax matched because taxation was done in rice. Right? If that is the case, this is the first time where I'm saying that it is, Mahadevan identifies the sign as Jar. Right? Um, there are two jars. One is jars with a handle, one is a jar. And in both cases, my interpretation is quite uh, different. Um, again, uh, you can go either which way, but I'm saying that this is a comprehensive way of looking at it. Um, and uh, so, the, there is a lot of uh, issue to this. Why? Uh, the claim is that there is the rice was not important in Indus Valley. And why the hell would they use Ari? as the way to represent tax. Um, but if you look at Proto-Dravidian and you look at the uh, root word Ari and uh, its reference to rice, uh, oh, the proportion of that word is significant, right? Uh, so hence, it was important enough that it formed a major uh, part of the vocabulary of uh, Proto-Dravidian. So the word, so hence the rice, even in old times, was important in, in uh, Proto-Dravidian. Proto um, and Proto-Dravidian, by the way, is not only of the south. You have uh, Brohi, which sits in Afghanistan. And there are many other variations of uh, Proto-Dravidian, which are all over the place. So the, the fact is that just because a crop is more precious, it not being used to ta for tax is maybe not the right argument. At least I would prefer to think that, hence, because it is more precious, you are taxed in that. And the word for tax, hence, becomes Ari. Right? 
So I can't go through all the signs, but I will, some of them I've already spoken. Uh, so I'll keep going to ones which matter. King's share. That sign is that of a harrow, right? I'm saying it correctly, harrow, the uh, rake. Um, and uh, the uh, word for raking in Proto-Dravidian is koru. And the word for king's share in Proto-Dravidian is also koru, right? Uh, so hence, I get to interpret that as king's share. And it has that similarity to the uh, Sumerian sign uh, for big or great or the prefix to man to make it a king, right? Uh, so from that standpoint, I feel, okay, I've done good work, but the critics are there and they, they should be listened to. They say that if you take this sign, flipping it over is highly unlikely in a linguistic sense. All respect to them, but if you have a better interpretation of this sign, I will take it. Right? So, um, because there is no other uh, valid interpretation in the context of uh, professions of this uh, particular sign. Also important is the volumetric uh, measure. Uh, and that I have uh, interpreted as the marakkal. I think all the Tamilians are going to kill me. Marakkal maybe is how I should say it. Anybody? Marakkal. Okay. So, uh, uh, that measure is used today also. Uh, and I will show you a picture of that. Um, and there is an equivalence in uh, Sumerian as well for that uh, science uh, usage. Uh, we'll move on. Rest of it, uh, I can. Uh, if there is a part. So again, the uh, sign used for malaka or uh, sprout um, is there in uh, Sumerian in different uh, forms uh, or to plant. So they have used it for giving permission to plant and so on and so forth. Right. So it is hence got that uh, context which is uh, useful. Yeah, so I am running out of time, but I'll keep uh, moving. So I told you that uh, the, there is a word for stingray fish. So it is there. Uh, the sign is 211. So um, uh, tenki is the uh, word for uh, stingray uh, fish. Or it could simply mean, sorry, I said, said it incorrectly. Correctly, OK. So uh, or I didn't, I, even, uh, uh, growing up, my mom's a vegetarian, so she was very happy cooking chicken and mutton, but not fish. So I don't know all these varieties of fish, but uh, I got to know uh, in time. So uh, Gouda, Gudem uh, is also something unique. Uh, fishing hamlet paying tax, right? So that's how I would interpret it. Um, and um, yeah, there are a lot of number signs. And there is that day sign from Sumeria also. Uh, like somebody pointed out it is sleeping, here it is standing, uh, but it's okay. Uh, so uh, uh, if you could use it in Sumeria for daily wage, maybe it has a similar use here also. Um, and I've given the Sumerian equivalence when it was standing. Right? Uh, that's how it was uh, used. Um, yeah, so um, this, 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 uh, this is all the high frequency signs. But also I have left out a few signs which were there on the object 1400, which is all uh, finished off here in terms of the interpretation. Why I have left it out? Because it, the frequency is less than 100. So I didn't want to go through all the, and there is one which is only one, that 179. But the, uh, the uh, flow in itself has been, uh, uh, has occurred 35 uh, times. So this is the uh, nature of the uh, interpretation and it's uh, the individual signs. But it has to work in a seal. So we'll talk about that. And the numbers. So by now we have covered a lot of the signs if we accept the hypothesis. Lot more than most people have covered in their uh, work. Now there are numbers. So numbers are also going to be easy or difficult. So if you look at uh, the uh, 86 through 121, those are easy. They, are, they seem to be numbers uh, and you just count the number of uh, strokes. The long strokes, however, have usually been used with volumetric measure, the marakka. So it's been used with uh, that. Um, and uh, the fractions are also there. And these are very speculative, but it's based on the num frequency of occurrence. Though the half circle, uh, you see that uh, 81 times it has been used. So if the ones have been taken, so that could be the 10. 20, 30, and so on. Uh, and then with additional strokes, they become 11, 12, 13, because there is no other way of uh, doing that. And then the next is the 100, because there are 27 occurrences. And the next is only two occurrences. So 
I'm expecting that as the denominations go higher, there will be lesser usage of that. Uh, because maybe 1,000 bastas of rice is not something that was traded in uh, good old Indus uh, Valley. And all the way down to, okay, that is all the same, uh, but the numbers uh, vary. Right? So that's how the, those have been interpreted. So by now we have covered even more of the signs, 420 of those, by now we have covered even more. So now uh, let's look at the seals itself. Um, and uh, some of these, uh, as I said, uh, there have been work done before. R.P. Rao proposes this structure for the uh, seals. Um, so it is, for me, it is not important that uh, the structure of the seal uh, is what I'm interpreting, but whether my symbols fit in there, right? And uh, so if you look at it, the tax will always come to the left. Uh, so something is being taxed. Um, and then the commodity being taxed is somewhere in the middle. And the signs for Uru and Gudem will come in the front, right? So um, this town is paying a tax uh, of this amount for this commodity, right? Uh, is how uh, to interpret it. And all the signs which I've interpreted will uh, fit into this. There are complex signs, there are simpler signs, but these simpler signs don't even have numbers, which means that the numbers could be separate signs which are used uh, post, saying that after this you just put the number, saying that this is the quantum. Uh, and that's how maybe that seal could have also been uh, made. Um, and uh, this is a little more detail on the numbering itself. Um, and uh, thanks to Sridhar, I was able to get that marakal in his, uh, from his house. Um, use the measure to look at what is the, uh, how much is the measure. This is a 4 litre household marakal. Apparently there is also an 8 litre household marakal. But there is extensive work done by an individual by name Wells. Uh, he took the uh, uh, pots, he didn't take them out, but he uh, analyzed the pots in the National Museum in Delhi and determined the volume of the pots and uh, saw that based on the uh, numbering, the, there is a multiplication factor to the volume of the uh, pots. Um, and th that volume which he has mentioned is 10x. So it is not like uh, one marakal. It is actually, so one marakal being, let's say, four liters, if I use one, my, my logic, actually 40 liters in his measure. Uh, but uh, at least there is some connection between today's marakal and uh, what uh, was being uh, measured. And also there are other measures like what I would call 409 as a balance, and uh, it is associated with fractions, right? Uh, looks like fractions, uh, one third and two thirds and so on. Uh, so what you have seen so far, is that uh, there is an interpretation of high frequency uh, Indus signs um, and uh, there is an interpretation of object 1400 um, and uh, these two are quite unique. The fact that they are trade signs, uh, there have been other people who have done that work, especially Bhata and uh, Rao are the ones I would like to point out. Uh, uh, um, Rao's paper I've read, but with Bhata I've interacted, uh, so significantly uh, learnt uh, from these uh, individuals, be it through reading or be it uh, through uh, speaking. Uh, however, the interpretation of each individual sign, the way I've put it, and the interpretation of the object is absolutely uh, a different way of looking at it, and that forms the basis for the rest of the work. Um, and uh, this is very specific, cohesive, comprehensive compared to any of the work that you will uh, see there, even though I am saying it. Um, like I said, anybody who does, does this work will anyway get beaten, as well say it and get beaten. Right? So, yeah. And also, particularly the way I have gone about deciphering, you will see that there is dual use of words, like Koru being for raking, as well as for king share. And that works only in proto Dravidian that way. I have not found it to work. I am not an expert in Sanskrit. I know enough South Indian languages and I have studied enough of the Proto-Dravidian dictionaries that I am able to comment on that. But I am not able to find an equivalent because I know Hindi also quite well. I don't know Sanskrit. So if there are people who find this method works for Sanskrit, all the power, the method is still mine. <laughs> yeah. So this is more speculative. Um, and these are the most important signs that you should be speculating about because the one on the top uh, is called the yogi seal. Um, somebody said yes? Yeah. So, um, and um, um, it's called Proto Shiva, Pasupati, uh, and a lot of uh, various uh, names. 
Um, but to me, uh, today, after going through this work, uh, it is potentially a tax collector seal, um, uh, st stating the items that person can tax. Uh, and having an iconography which once uh, he puts the seal uh, will not be able to be replicated because these seals when handmade are unique. They will have uh, features which cannot be replicated because each one of them are going to be very uh, different. So this particular seal for me initially I was trying to interpret it as a name and that name uh, for me was Ayappa or Ayappan because the iconography around it uh, was significantly related to the story of Ayappa. Right? Uh, so you see that one character standing on a tiger. Do you see it? Let me see if the pointer will work. Right there. This is the tiger and this is the gentleman. You see it? You see it, right? Yeah. yeah. So that has been, this man has been interpreted as part of this text, uh, this sequence of signs by uh, early scholars, but to me this is a very standard representation of Ayappa on a tiger. That's one, one story. You know that Ayappa story is mom wants her biological son to become the prince, so she sends her adopted son to fetch her, uh, you know, uh, some milk from a tiger for a cure which she's pretending, uh, 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 for an illness she's pretending to have. Right, so then you have the bull. Bull is very prominent because the whole purpose of Ayappa's birth is the killing of Ma Mahishi. Now Mahishi comes in all uh, stories. Durga killed him or uh, I guess him or her, Mahisha Sura. Uh, and so many other people killed. I guess there was a problem with this Mahishi or Mahisha Sura. But the uh, whole purpose of Ayappa's birth was that. So when he goes into the forest, first he encounters the bull and gets rid. Also there is an elephant. Elephant is strongly associated, I think, um, Advaita, you are from uh, Kerala. You would have seen Ayappa and elephants strongly associated. Uh, of course. Sorry, no? Yes. 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 Um, the only one which is a mystery here is there is a rhinoceros also. <laughs> uh, so hence you have to say that it, the speculation is not complete. Uh, but then this, this seal is uh, saying that this is part of the iconography which means it's part of this, not part of the script. So I'm not interpreting it. And this I'm saying that tax collector's name and hence I'm saying that these are logo syllabic which means that it could be used for numbers and uh, commodities etc. But it could also be used for uh, name and uh, the things the person can tax. And similarly there is a fig uh, deity as it's called. There's a lady standing amongst a cre creeper or a plant and there is a person kneeling down. Are you able to see it? Yes. No, is it? Okay. So there is a person kneeling down here. Okay, if you see that, there is a person kneeling down here, there is an animal behind him and there is a lady here. Why is there a lady? That is the braid. There is a long braid. So always whenever they see a braid, they will call it a lady. So there is a deity, a female deity and there is a person kneeling down and the female deity is friends. Valli is a story which uh, uh, and Murgan's uh, approach to Wali is exactly like this. Today you will find similar iconography in uh, temples where Wali when she is 12 years old is sent out to the fields to scare away the birds. You stand on a platform and scare away the birds and um, Murgan in his hunting comes um, and uh, sees Wali and uh, proposes to her and she chases him away and he tries two or three times including taking the help of an elephant before Wali and Murgan uh, get uh, married. Um, and when Wali is uh, there chasing away the birds, there are her friends, usually seven of them, which are depicted. So you'll see this artwork even today. Uh, if, when you look for uh, Wali and Murgan, uh, you'll see similar kind of artwork uh, even today. So somebody probably has used that artwork to depict uh, a unique sign for themselves. But they're also saying that uh, I'm able to do this taxation and this is my name. This is interesting uh, sign which is there, right there. Um, it is part of the iconography, but uh, uh, it usually it means a roof. If it is a roof, roof is called vend. Vend also means uh, something to do with the deity. So potentially it's part of the iconography saying this is a divine character, right, Wali. Wali is worshipped. So, uh, so th that is the nature of the decipherment. I know I'm in, at the end of time, so this is the dancing girl statue in uh, 
uh, in this valley you would have seen it it doesn't look like this but you put it into mid journey ai art and this is <laughs> this is what comes out um, and all the artwork that you have seen throughout is thanks to uh, mid journey so i'll sp stop there i know we are out of time but if advaita allows we'll take some questions you are allowing okay <laughs> So Gopi, I don't think so that the Ayyappan or Murugu because the Rudra and then as per the Rugveda and all, we don't have the Murugan or Ayyappan those because the ancient uh, Rugveda always talked about Rudra and then Indra, all other things, but there is no other deities. They are followed by the later right. civilizations, but I don't think so. But that's one comment. But rest of them, yeah. No, yeah. but uh, you make an important comment because the gap between the end of the um, end of the uh, what we call as IVC Indus Valley Civilization and the writing um, and the beginning of the Vedas uh, being found, there is a significant uh, gap. The uh, findings in Rakhigari, they found 11 skeletons of which one was that of a lady. This lady is very important because she is the only one whose uh, skeleton had soft tissue remains from some 3000 years ago from behind the ear. That person who died in the Indus Valley does not have any uh, DNA pertaining to what is called ancestral North Indian or steppe pastoralist. There has been a landmark paper on that from the Deccan College. Uh, in these times when they were also, uh, it was very difficult to publish it. The headlines were meeting the political needs. The contents were meeting actually what their research was. It's very clear that it is very less likely that uh, these people who live there, now there are arguments, it was only one person, that one person could have come from somewhere else, uh, it is very rare that women come from somewhere else uh, in the migration uh, process and died there and buried with 11 other people. Uh, so right now very few scholars will use anything other than a Dravidian hypothesis. So that is for me a happy thing because for 30 years I have been using the Dravidian hypothesis. So the Vedas what we are talking about comes much after any of these things that we are talking about. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have read that uh, uh, the seals which have been found uh, originating from Indus Valley, uh, found in the like sites like Dil Moon and other places, are quite many. In contrast to that, <coughs> uh, the exchange or the cuneiform script or anything like clay tablet, anything that is coming from Elamite or Sumerian culture to Indus Valley, there is hardly any kind of uh, um, yeah. Yeah, evidence or found yeah. artifacts. So uh, if, if it is regarding trade, why, what, what in your uh, view that interprets to? Yeah, so the, when you trade with a foreign country, um, let's say, we'll speculate, and I mean, at the time where it takes a good amount of time to reach the foreign country. Now, will I take their currency and come back to my country? What will I do with that? Right? So, from that standpoint, uh, the, the, there could be multiple ways of trading, uh, including uh, gold, including other forms of barter with a foreign country. But internal to my country, I need a way to exchange goods. It's why I, my country is uh, seals are pertaining and I find larger number of those here. Right, so that's the way to think, at least one. But if you are saying uh, that it is more about uh, trading licenses and yes. not the currency, person, yeah. then, then what? I mean, no, it is not that, a currency. Even that, let's say even that, in your... let's say that uh, uh, the land uh, has to be uh, provided to somebody to do agriculture. And uh, that person has to be paying a tax for using that land for that purpose. I am doing all that within my country, in fact within a region, I am not doing that with uh, Sumeria. So with Sumeria, there is lapis lazuli for example, there is a, a blue stone, there is a lot of trade of that. In exchange to that, we would have got something uh, and uh, so, the, so that is how I, I would suggest to think about it. Yes. As, as the design, sorry, sorry, uh, one more, in uh, the same context. Okay. So, has there been decipherment of the purpose of the cylinder seals or other seals in the Sumeria, like cuneiform? There are cylinder seals yes, which are from course. that culture. Yeah. What was the purpose of those seals which are also of the smaller size and yeah. like this? So the, those seals typically show 
a king holding two tigers uh, on either side of the arm. It is aggrandization of the royal. And we don't have, that's why this gentleman here pointed out that uh, there is less likely uh, that there was a very strong royal uh, uh, structure in Indus Valley. Uh, there are no, not many weapons found also. In fact, uh, you will not find weapons, but there is a hunting line. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I, okay. uh, I must appreciate your work. I mean, certain things are really coming out with much clarity. Six months ago, I was in Raki Gadi. Hmm. Of course, uh, expecting monsoon, they had covered all the digging. But all these seals, I met the same gentleman whom you had uh, made yeah. a reference. And he gave me seals. One or two I got at my home now. Oh, <laughs> That apart, I have three questions. Uh -huh. One is that uh, uh, this dancing girl, is she a dancing girl or he was some kind of a industrialist woman that point of time? Well, you see one, one left hand, <laughs> she actually putting on her waist yes. is kind of authoritative posture in my view. That is one. Second, because you did not cover much of it. Second is that though you linked Murgan, Valley, things like that. But the broad observation is that all Indus Valley uh, <coughs> sites are connected with, uh, you know, the Kurukshetra, I mean, sorry, this uh, Mahabharata sites. Very close to Rakigari, you can see there is a place where the stories are being told that uh, the Pandavas performed their ancestral, you know, whatever... Uh, so, I can't remember more than two questions, so I can answer those two, then you can ask. No, me. I'll finish third because if but somebody, somebody has to remind me. <laughs> okay, I will remind myself. Yeah. Raki Gadi, there are 23 layer, layers, that is what we were told. So, if you really dig all this, many things may come up. So, of this. Yeah. So, uh, the first question was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the dancing girl. The term dancing girl stuck uh, because whoever initially gave that uh, term uh, because the lady had like Lombardis, you have seen uh, bangles all the way to the top on one hand and holding the uh, posture like that. Um, but yeah, you, and very slick oiled hair. It is not like uh, um, <laughs> the saloon, uh, saloon hair. So, uh, so the interpretation of that person as a dancing girl uh, is not uh, sacrosanct. So if you say that she was an indes industrialist, fine. But she was not wearing clothes, that much I can tell. No, no, clothes is worn up, you know. Maybe she was having a... Oh, some other uh, fabric, uh, yeah. And the same, this... Yeah, it is a good, it is a, the, your speculation is as good as whoever called See, it. The entire left hand is bangles. Yeah. There is a, on uh, Vaikuntha Ekadashi, you visit Shiva temple, there is a Musa called uh, Mohini. Uh, you see the decoration of that. Full left hand. Yeah. All I will tell you is this. The iconography of that lady, your interpretation is as good as the first person who interpreted. The way it was made was using the lost wax process of bronze making. That lost wax process continued into the Chola times. Today if you go to Swami Malai, you will find it. Same lost wax process. So this is a Bronze Age, uh, age civiliza civilization. I can talk about the engineering aspects of how the lady was made, not who the lady was. <laughs> Your second question. Uh, well, the connection not, between these places of the yeah, yeah. So and see, the yeah. See, if you have a river, if you have a river, over the ages, everything will be around that only. But when Mahabharata happened, when Indus Valley happened, Mahabharata, um, uh, happened, uh, see, Indus Valley is a historical uh, certainty. There, there are homes made with bricks, uh, with uh, various seals found and so on and so forth. So that's one category of uh, things pertaining to our dear country. Mahabharata is another category of things belonging to our dear country. I'm equally passionate about Mahabharata. But in Kurukshetra was Arjuna's bow found. Or why, why do we say that? So, we cannot link even in a scholarly discussion, we have to de-link. And uh, say that, yeah, uh, we have the mythology and people will fight with me. 
but it is mythology until we find uh, written see history is only when there is written evidence or some dated evidence based on carbon dating or there are seals uh, stating something even now this since we can't interpret the seals it is history or prehistory because we found artifacts right so but i am not uh, saying that it didn't happen on the same sites we don't know what the timings were if it happened at all but we are actually talking about two different dimensions of uh, things we can talk later on that because i know your head is running uh, one comment and one small question i know this marakal this marakal looks yeah. uh, the marakal that i know deep south yes, india yes, yes. is a little bigger yes. and 21 measures of that marakal will fill a full gunny bag yes that is oh, called a kotai that's, that's called a kotai kotai 21 marakals used to fill a kotai and i have physically done that oh. so it looks like a uh, maybe that somewhere it change size yes, yes. Uh, that's number one no the um, bigger one is there the farm house marakal hmm. is 8 liters like i said this is a household marakal okay. so there is a farm house marakal which i can't lay my hands on hmm. so i just put the household marakal okay yeah. but you are right and also it is important what you are saying because there is a tamil measurement system which has yes. been there for a long time it is there yeah. today it is not there in other south it is not there in andhra yeah. uh, in the, at that level of detail and the tamil numbering system so there is significant amount of work i have done in that area what i am just showing you is things which publishers accept to publish and when the actually when the guys measure the paddy and yeah. put it into the uh, gunny bag yeah the first marakal is actually called swami rakshika ah okay i mean, sort of you just sort of uh, as a kind of a, a convention yeah. second my, my small question yeah. is there any continuity in the script or the iconography to adichanallur or kiradi now yeah is there anything like that yeah so i've been to rakigari by the way i'll answer uh, I'll, i'll also answer this together so kiladi also i've been to kiladi as of now the dating is ad uh, even though they have uh, said that it could go back most of the dating is ad so there's a significant 700 year gap between uh, indus valley and kiladi kiladi also the pots i've seen it's got a black coating inside so very different than the uh, very standard pottery found across all indus uh, valley uh, sites um, and there has been uh, scratches found which they have tried to interpret as some form of communication but nothing similar to uh, indus valley script has been found in kiladi no scripts have been found no scripts have been uh, found um, yeah so and the t- uh, there is a lot of absences have been through many sites there are many things which are similar including the brickwork and so on but it's just the time difference is huge right uh, so that's the challenge is that uh, we, we uh, even then it is 2000 years old but this is even more older so that is still 700 years difference is a huge difference you are uh, sorry i'll come yeah rakhi gari the layering also if you have since you have gone there you would have seen that the road in rakhi gari is cut from the mountain you'll be surprised all the layers are visible and uh, you can just see the civilization because as you get new civilization it compresses the older civilization so you get layers the smallest layer then little bigger little bigger little bigger because the uh, layers above which are closest to what would have been most recent are the least compressed you can pull out pot shreds and i have got pot shreds at home you got seals which are invaluable i i have got pot shreds uh, small ones at home why is you ah we'll come back we'll we'll take his question because i've been putting it off sorry yes, you mentioned the, uh, the the big sign at mulavira yes when we gone there the uh, guide said this is most most, most likely a welcome sign or a name of the city mm. it's not not likely to be a, a merchant or you know a trading kind of sign yeah. have you tried applying your methodology yes. to that sign yes it is even more speculative that's why i didn't publish but i'll tell you uh, part of that sign is actually there in other uh, signs which are, which are in the trade seals category part of that sign uh, and in the middle is a sort of a conjoining sign you'll you'll find something like this uh, so uh, in my interpretation it is it is a sign since you've been there it is a archway which opens into a courtyard and that courtyard is a marketplace 
so that sign is saying that this is a marketplace and uh, so the uh, one of my reviewers got very angry because i said it's a marketplace pertaining to these two villages and uh, he was really upset at uh, how dare i make such a leap of faith i agree with that but since you asked i'm telling you that uh, if it was a market in fact i don't know if you have seen the ground it's full of bones either somebody had a party recently <laughs> or i i can't understand every layer has only bones bones of uh, not human bones uh, chicken or something like that right so um, either it was a sacrificial place uh, or a market place and this was announcing what it was saying you like you said welcome to the market place uh, chitra sante or whatever it might be right so that's my interpretation sir there is no rice and they call it as wheat or barley which one there is no rice in that area it could be a wheat or barley for the that's yeah. what uh, there is some comments for mahadevan's aris yeah no he didn't say uh, uh, aris i said aris oh, he said jar uh, okay. uh, yeah he said jar for my aris the reviewer commented that uh, so it's not about mahadevan okay. i had a reviewer went all over puked all over that and said how can uh, you call this rice rice was not so important in uh, indus valley yeah. Yeah, but then i did more work thanks to his pointer and uh, found out that there is a significant amount of not wet land rice farming but dry land rice farming which is uh, not the volume production so if you look at on the gangetic plain 6000 years ago they had wetland rice farming which came from apparently china japan right so the wetland rice farming which my ancestors also do requires a river which will flood the uh, you know field uh, you know dr narayanan you will also probably know since you have done that so you flood the field and you have a very mathematical way of farming the dry land uh, rice farming was existing in indus valley there have been uh, Uh, in indus valley there have been fires and in that fires there have been uh, ruins in those ruins they have found that rice was there it is just that it is dry land rice so you if you search for your hypothesis to be validated you can find it but that's not the right way that's not the right way but uh, i don't think you can separate rice from india so quickly pratibha has got a question So uh, Advaita, you tell us when. Uh... <laughs> Last okay. question. I had a question. This is regarding uh, those um, tablets. Those are made of clay, baked clay, I suppose. So you are absolutely right. They are called sea light. If I'm, uh, they are baked uh, in a form that becomes very hard. Uh, you are the material scientist, uh, Pratibha. <laughs> you should. Tell. But yeah, the starting point is uh, clay. Okay. So the next question is. so the writings were done before it was baked or it was done after was it no, no, scratched no, before, on the tablet before before, before. Yeah. well uh, rest of the question i'll ask you There's later one i think she has not asked the question so we can close with that yes if you don't mind we'll chat after yeah. huh? thank you <laughs> thank you for such a scholarly discussion and obviously there's a lot of effort and patience that's gone into your work so thank you so much for that my question is about the dating um and you know i just want to ask your considered scholarly opinion on say the work of nilesh nilkant ok who says that he's got research from seven different disciplines to date the mahabharata and things like that yeah. so what is your opinion on that if i'm right mr ok was a ge guy uh, before he started writing so he is a very passionate uh, individual um but i'll tell you what the dating methods used typically are i believe that there is some influence of that uh, with him also so in the mahabharata there is a eclipse mentioned during which time jayadratha was killed so that whole sequence of uh, events are used to determine when such an eclipse occurred and that dates um, uh, the uh, uh, war kurukshetra war it won't be accepted as a scholarly way to do it we as people of um, faith believing that that is true then we can go and accept but uh, that is not presentable in a, a scholarly context is my view a humble view because you are taking an event and uh, you are taking uh, elements of that event 
and then you are back calculating based on that and using astronomy uh, and astrology to some extent saying that that kind of an eclipse occurred 5000 years ago so hence uh, you know this uh, that eclipse occurred then there was no other eclipse it is very tough for me. I am not scholarly enough to know all the fields required. He, like he said, mm. so many disciplines, but it will not fly. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you everyone for coming and uh, interacting. <laughs> <laughs>